right. Are we on? All right. There we go. Okay. This is um, somewhat, <laughs> somewhat nuts here. And uh, give me, give me a second here. Okay. Uh, I absolutely, I am going to have to change my, uh, my software provider because things are just not working out. I am sorry that you all have to go through this, uh, but so be it. So be it. Uh, that's okay. There are other people and I'll figure out. I don't think it's my connection, but we are not here to talk about my technical difficulties. Uh, so I am going to, uh, I'm just going to have to um, just uh, deal with it. Hey, we've got someone from France. Let's see. Uh, let's see. Uh, Gar um, hands Bill a cold brew and a Snickers. Well, you know what? Today I have for chameleons and coffee, I have a uh, a drip, a hot drip. I know that a number of you are, um, are, are purists when it comes to coffee and you only like the hot stuff. So, oh, well, uh, today, today it's for you. So, my goodness, what a, <laughs> it's been quite a week. If any of you have been following my Instagram, you know, on stories, I did a lot of, um, I, I am now taking care of all of the geckos. And because Yvette, Misty Mountain Fans, my wonderful and beautiful wife, is, uh, is off visiting family. And so I now take care of all the chameleons and all the geckos and uh, the caging and the, uh, the social media and all that kind of stuff. And it has been quite, <laughs> quite the, the challenge. Now, when I'm gone, she has to take care of uh, everything. So we, we trade back and forth and that's how we do vacations, but I don't think we're, uh, ever, I don't know what's going to happen if we ever decide we're going to, uh, take a vacation together. So, uh, let's see, how long does it take you to care for all the animals daily? All right. Uh, honestly, um, it is, I, I wake up and I've got to check, uh, check all the eggs. All of the eggs need to be checked twice a day, morning and evening. The babies need to be sprayed down morning and evening. And all of the adults and the breeders, these are the geckos, need to be uh, uh, fed and watered. And then all the chameleons need to be taken care of. And then I have, you know, I want to apologize to everybody. I didn't get my uh, Panther Chameleon podcast episode out yesterday. And that's because I... I did all the recording and found out that the camera was focused on the cages behind me and not me. And so I have to do it over again. And the, that wouldn't have been such a, a big problem, except now I don't have time. So, uh, yeah, I, I waited, wait until the last minute on that one, but, uh, I'm going to catch up with that. And so at least by Monday, we're going to get that episode out. It's going to be all about, uh, questions. I'm going to be doing some very basic questions uh, all about panther chameleons. And so I'm going to get back on schedule with that. So, oh, you, uh, Jenny, you missed the stories. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I was a little bit, uh, I was tired. I was uh, sleep drunk, meaning not, not have nothing to do with alcohol. But when I get sleepy, I get silly. And uh, so I was playing around on Instagram stories, posting just my, just my uh, observations about life. And so, yeah, we, uh, I had some fun with that, but, um, it was so cool seeing those little baby geckos come out of their egg. Oh my goodness. And so, yeah, I, I enjoy it. And you know, what's really special. It's something that my wife and I do together and there is, I don't know how to describe how special it is it is to build something together i know when you you have a, a husband wife and you raise a kid together 
that's that's a little bit different. I'm not sure how to explain it, but when we're doing something that enriches each other and we're doing it together, it's very special. And so, uh, yes, I'm talking about how much work it is and stuff, but I just, I'm so glad that I have the opportunity, this little window of time, and I don't know how long it's going to last. You know, you never know what life is going to throw at you, but for this little window of time, I am grateful for this, this, uh, this space that I have that I, I can do this with Yvette. It's, it's a lot of fun. I love it. Poland. Yeah. Ha <laughs> ha. Hello. Love it. Uh, good to have you here from Poland. Let's see. Uh, Rep debris indoors. Yes or no. Well, Mark, that depends on what your indoors is like and which chameleon you have. Uh, the thing about uh, Rep debris is it's a screen cage. Uh, so is does your indoors have the humidity necessary? If not, you can still use a rep debris. You can still use a screen cage. You just got to block uh, block off the sides. I actually have a rep debris that uh, I needed more humidity. And so I got that clear shrink fit window insulation and I put it all around the sides and the back and the front door and it works great. And so uh, the you know, there's two questions that are hidden within that question. It's uh, what do you think about screen cages indoor? I mean, that screen cages, it's I, screen cages are used when your outside environment, whatever's outside the cage is right about what you want for the chameleon. The more ventilation you have, the uh, the closer, the more, <laughs> so the more ventilation you have, uh, the more the inside of your cage is going to match the outside of the cage. So if you have conditions that are very good for your chameleon species on the outside of your cage, then a screen cage is perfect. I use screen cages outdoors. Well, of course, you don't want to do a hybrid cage outdoors. But uh, since that is very good for a number of species of chameleons, it's all screen cages. Indoors, I have the air conditioning running, and so it's sucking humidity out of the air. Uh, it's cooler. I don't want the chameleons having the, the, that cool draft. At least not, there's certain species that I don't. Like my panthers, I don't want them to have that. My Oshonisei, they do. I want them to have the coolness. So uh, indoors, I generally use the hybrid cages, so I have more control over the humidity. Uh, so the second part of that question is Rep Debris, the, uh, the brand, and the brand's fine. I use uh, Rep Debris. Even though I have my own caging company, uh, I still use Reptobreeze. I use other ca other people's cages. Uh, uh, every different manufacturer has uh, advantages. Uh, Dragon Strand is uh, pretty uh, mid to uh, mid level, and so the quality is really uh, really there. But so is the cost, and so is waiting for it because it's handmade in San Diego. Uh, Reptobreeze are very easy to get a hold of. They're cheap. And when I just want to throw stuff together and experiment with it, I I, I have many Reptobreezes that I use. And uh, I I mean, they're good for they're good for uh, general purpose. Hello, Looney Bands. Make sure they're stainless steel. Yeah, I'll leave with the eyes. Um, the other thing is with the Reptobreeze, they always have a part that will rust. And sometimes it changes. Sometimes it's the pin for the hinges. Sometimes it's the screws. They finally got the, the screen to be aluminum and not just painted metal, uh, metal so it doesn't rust through. And, and so I use a Reptobreeze until it falls apart. And yes, it's going to fall apart sooner than a Dragon Strand will. But you know, you know, you know the characteristics of the cage and you use the, uh, the one that's appropriate for whatever you're, uh, whatever you're doing. Um, now, uh, let's see, I got to give an update as to the Shamrock Chameleon Project. Uh, for those uh, new, I am working with a, a species of uh, chameleon that's pretty rare. It's called Kaluma Oshonasii, and, uh, or common name Shamrock Chameleon, because Oshonasii's chameleon is, nobody says that. Everybody calls them O's and Kind of like to have a more, <laughs> they deserve a little bit more than the call to O. So the Shamrock Chameleons, it's a, it's a respected, it's a respectable name. 
Uh, and so my shamrocks are doing very well. Uh, I had a number of successful matings last week and those females, one female is, uh, is just hunkering down, isn't doing much. The other female is just uh, chowing down. The first female that's not doing much, I reintroduced her to the male and she made it very clear that the first time was enough. So uh, I believe that I have two uh, fertile clutches. So you, uh, I'll be able to provide uh, unrelated uh, bloodlines, uh, unrelated F1s. And uh, if all goes well, obviously this is just the first of many steps that need to go right. So um, I now have probably four, four months, four or five months of gestation. That's, that's normal for Kaluma. And then I'll have a couple of months of diet pause once the eggs are laid. Uh, and I think I'm going to go right into diapause on this one. Uh, that that's that seems to be a no, number of people who have you worked with diapause have said, okay, that seems to be working. And, uh, and then coming out the other end, I'll have another 12 months. So 14 months plus four months. So 18, 19 months. <laughs> We're looking at 2025 before I'm able to uh, to offer these. Uh, to the people who want to work with this species. But uh, but what I really like about that is it gives me and everybody else 18 to 24 months to get ready. Uh, the, the shamrock chameleon, you know, every chameleon has certain parameters, but they're different than panther chameleons. And most of our husbandry is wrapped around panther chameleon husbandry. I mean, you look at it, it really is. And for good reason, because there's a lot of panther chameleons out there. And uh, we have to change that up for Jackson's, and we'll have to change that up for the Shamrock. Just a little bit, though. But we get the uh, it gives us time. My hatchling is two weeks today. Thanks for your content. Nat V, I'm very glad that you uh, enjoy this content and that your hatchling is doing well. How is your hatchling doing? Um, let's see, Eliza Ann. What temperatures do they seem to prefer? Liza and, um, yeah, so uh, I am working on figuring that out. Generally speaking, uh, coming from the Rana Mafana area, that's where I saw them. They have a, a bit of a wide range. And it was, oh, number one, very humid. Wet is the thing with shamrock chameleons. We're going to have to uh, really work on our internal husbandry to be able to give them the wet that they want without the mold and fungus and that comes with having constantly wet surfaces in captivity. Uh, and so, uh, but temperature wise, they're, they're, they're doing fine in the mid seventies. They don't really go for the, the high temperatures. So they're not much for basking, uh, at least not mine. And see, he, this is where I have to, really put in the work over the next uh, year or so, because I go back and I look at everybody else's experience. And uh, there's one who is saying that they're O'Shaughnessy, I love to bask. So, so this is the challenge. Uh, and, and you all know, when you go on the internet, you see all of these conflicting uh, pieces of information. Uh, the approach is, as long as the people are reputable, and you say, okay, they know what they're doing. How come it's contradicting? It's because there's something else going on. So I don't know, for the person who had their astronomy eye basking, I don't know how cold their nights were. Uh, mine are cool, but not cold. So, uh, you know, there's always something going on around it. I'm going to spend the next year trying things out and experimenting uh, not just so I can make them happy, but I can uh, understand it well enough to put it into a care guide that will be extensive and comprehensive. So the uh, people uh, joining in being the F1 generation are going to get off to as solid of a start as possible. Uh, so Lizanne, the short question, the short answer is at this point, it looks like uh, they're cool um, and not much not much for heat, but, you know, in the, the Rana Mafana area during the day, it got pretty warm, but it also was very humid. So 
Uh, you know, that the thing is, when we in captivity and we have them in a, a rep to breeze in our house with 30% relative humidity, and then we put on the heat lamp, that's different than if it's high humidity uh, with a lot of ventilation. So let's see. Is it uh, Emma Lynn Rodriguez? Is it safe to take my five month old chameleon outside? Every time I open his cage, he's quick to get out and seems like he wants to go outside. You mean outdoors? Uh, it is safe to bring them outdoors as long as they can get away from the sun. Uh, that's the one thing. The sun is so powerful. You don't want to put them out just in a screen cage to where they're just going to be baked. Because, I mean, you we, we go to the beach and we lay out in the sun after a while. Uh, we need protection and they are no different and it's, it's too easy just to leave them there. So you got to watch out for uh, getting too much sun. In your air. Oh, Jenny says in your experience, do you have elderly chameleon issues with shooting their food? My six year old female seems all fine, but she simply has a problem extending her tongue. Uh, yes, Jenny. Uh, I have that. I have different issues come up with my aging chameleons. I've had a number of chameleons uh, just get to their, where they're really old. And some chameleons shoot fine until the end, and some seem to struggle. And so I don't see a pattern in what issues come up with old age in my chameleons. Uh, and the... Uh, the significance of that would be I would be looking at my husbandry and saying, okay, what can I do better? Uh, I don't know. Thing is with old chameleons, it's a, it's a lifetime of my husbandry. So me relating uh, what problems I have is is of uh, a 50-50 benefit to other people. But uh, yeah, I've had some tongue problems. Um Let's see, panther chameleon. Oh, this is uh, Nat who just had a uh, panther chameleon hatch. Got three month old called Barbie. Excellent. Let's see, Genevieve says, since you called the first clutch from both wild caught parents F1, what would you call a captive born uh, Honelli female breeding with a wild caught male? Okay, so let's go over these this filial generation. Uh, the filial, when you ever see F1, F2, F3, that is communicating how far from wild caught blood the baby is. So if the offspring from a wild caught parent is F1, and it doesn't matter if you have one parent that is F uh, wild caught, it doesn't matter how many generations in captivity the other one is, the offspring is always F1 because it's based off of how far from wild blood it is. You can only get F2 if you mate two F1s. And you only get F3 if you mate two F2s. If I have an F1 and an F2, the result is F2 because F1 is the closest to the wild. And so that is what this filial uh, generation works off of. Now, we in the chameleon community and we in the reptile community, <laughs> because gecko people have been doing this too, uh, have this captive CG. Sometimes you'll see that number CG1, F1 CG10. That means that captive generation, that is how many captive generations it is. So if you have a wild caught to a wild caught, that is a F1, CG1. If you take that F1 and you mate that F1 to a wild caught, well then filial, once again, it goes to the wild caught, the babies of that would be F1. But since the uh, uh, one of them was captive generate uh, was captive bred, the F1, it would be CG. Two, F1, CG2, because the F1 says how far from the wild is it? The CG says how far has this, the captive genes been refined? And the reason why this is important is especially with panther chameleons, because you, 
the most important critical linchpin of a panther chameleon breeding project is the female genetics because you don't see them and so you have to trust them and so if i have a female nosy bay true blue 10 generations and then i find a wild caught very blue male oh i want to put those two together that would that is gold but when i tell people i now have an f1 nosy bay they're going okay well what are the chances that this is going to be blue well when i tell them it's f1 cg10 well then they know holy cow okay this is an incredible pairing so that's i i know it's a you can ask any more questions as you can i know it's a little bit hard to grab onto unless you think about it a lot uh but that that's what the uh, numbers are about all about that was a hidden yawn is somebody <laughs> yes it's been i i've been spending late nights taking care of geckos um let's see uh, marks i've watched all the content on your channel really learned a lot need some merchandise of yours ah, <laughs> excellent okay well mark if you want to go uh you go to the website chameleonacademy.com there is a a store that you can go to you can get some good stuff there is uh there is stuff in my youtube shelf though as well you can get good merch like coffee cup t-shirts i just got a hoodie that i'm really happy with so uh so Genevieve, I'm thinking about breeding her, talking about uh, his whole Nelly. What is the best time of year for her first clutch? She just turned a year old. Um, let's see. Here in the United States, when we have, we have two seasons, um, a warm and a cold, uh, which is different than Kenya, where the Honelli comes from that has four wet season dry season wet season dry season so we have hot and cold uh i would say mate her whenever you want to because her body will decide when she's actually going to have those babies um let's see give me a second here uh and <laughs> i mean and, and really you don't have much of a choice there uh her her body's going to take over and decide when so I like to mate them in the late summer uh, or, or during the summer because I want those babies to uh, be born in spring. If I can get it during spring because then I can keep them outdoors and they go through the heat and that heat will help them grow. Uh, I've had uh, I've had like a brood of uh, Jackson's chameleons when they're born born in spring. They grow nice and big when they're born in the fall and they go through the winter outside uh then they're they don't grow as large now i'm okay with that i actually like that better because i like my females smaller uh, i do not like getting 50 babies at once from those huge females as much as everybody loves huge chameleons and takes that as a sign that they're the healthiest they can be yeah okay well good luck you can have it um, they're just as healthy when they're not that big and, uh, they're less of a headache when they actually have babies, but, uh, you don't have that problem with the Honelli They're They, they stay small. Let's see. Oh, everybody's taking a look at my yawns. I've been, I've been up late. Uh, do chameleons yawn? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Although it's hard to tell if they're yawning or if they're just stretching their jaws. Oh, sheesh. There's another uh, let's see mark gold needs some advice with ustaleta i have an f1 pair doing great really nice but can't read the color of the female for receptive behavior i just just bring her around the mail um on a regular basis and you may want to make sure you hit that window um and uh then she'll let you know really quick if she's receptive or not and that, that's one way you're way you're going to be able to train yourself in uh in what the colors mean that she gives you kayla i made one of your feeder run cups my leaf loves it works like a charm excellent i'm glad you enjoyed that yes i have a video on youtube that shows how to make feeder run cups and oh where do i have one <laughs> they're really simple 
See, this is what they look like. And the wonderful thing about that is you can use them for a little while and then, then toss them when they get uh, too old. Uh, they don't look great inside of a cage. They're very functional. And so you want something that looks great inside of the cage. You know, you get something like that, which is the uh, like the log lunch. Jim Reichbos makes those. Uh, so yeah, it all depends on your function. Like when I'm doing uh, when I'm doing acclimation, uh, quarantine, you know, I'm using the cheap stuff. <laughs> it doesn't look good, but it's functional and I can throw it away. So, you know, as always, different tools uh, for different situations. Use the right tool. Bill, do you recommend anyone? Oops, oops, what just happened? Oh, I just, uh, to, to give me a second, give me a second. Do you re recommend anyone to buy Fruit Fly Starter Cup skits? Uh, okay, Fruit Fly Starter Kits. Uh, let's see. Josh's Fly, I think, let's check to see if BioDude, because if, if BioDude has the Fruit Fly Starter Kits, then... Um, uh, you, then you can get 10% off. Let's see. Okay, it looks like, okay, BioDude. Yeah, BioDude has a uh, Fruit Fly Media Kit. So, yes, you can go uh, to BioDude.com and get their uh, Media Kit, and that's going to be... Um, that's going to be 10% off. Use the uh, coupon code CHAMELEON10. And you get 10% off. But uh, as to whether you want a to do a kit or stuff, I think when you start off, it's nice to have a kit so you have everything. And then you can, uh, as, you, as you get used to it and you've done it, then you can start looking and, uh, and sourcing things elsewhere. Uh, so, but starting off with the kit is a really good way to start. It, it gets you started on a, a good, uh, on a good footing. Uh, let's see. And Sophie Collin, I am building a hybrid cage for our first chameleon. We have a solar house and looking for saving energy. What is your opinion on UVB LED bars compared to a UVB bulb? I use the UVB bulbs. I've used those for many, many years, and I know how to use them, and I know how effective they are. LEDs, UVB LEDs are new to the market, and so I don't have years of experience with them. I can always take a reading, and people have taken a reading and said, okay, this works. But here's the thing. That solar meter just, just reads a certain aspect of that uh, of that light it doesn't take into account everything else that uh all the other characteristics of that light that we've spent years getting used to and don't realize so whenever we change technology it's always you gotta uh, i am cautious uh and also because so much of my material has is based on the bulbs, the T5 bulbs. So I am going to be moving very slowly towards UVB LEDs. I know a number of people have been using them and have reported that they seem to be working. So I'm not saying that it's risky. I'm just saying I don't have that experience. I, I, I'm i going to be this next year, I am going to be experimenting with them. And so uh, I will be able to share what I have done. But uh, at this point, I'll have to say, I'll, I have to step back and say, I just, I don't know. Don't know. Uh, Bill, just wait till you get seahorses. You'll be starting staring at the fish tank all day. Oh, <laughs> I've already uh, let my wife know that I've been thinking about getting a seahorse or seahorses. Uh, and so she's on alert. She knows that I've been thinking about it and that it may happen. And the way, way it happens is I think about something for literally years. And then one day there's an opportunity and I jump on it. And my wife's saying, what? This is where this come from. It's coming out of nowhere. And, yeah, well, I've been thinking about it for years. And so I've been preparing for years. And now's the time to do it. 
And so I've uh, let her know that I've been thinking about it just so we have that communication so she knows that it's brewing in the background. So um, when will I get a seahorse? I don't know, but I, it, I think I got to figure out the food thing first and uh, clear up. Yeah, so it, it'll probably be happening in the near future. <laughs> I don't, I know how I work. I'm not planning to do it right now, but I know how I work. So it may happen soon. Uh, let's see. Nathan Rowley. Love the videos. Is there any videos that show off your enclosures indoors collection tour? I do not have a reptile room tour. And the reason behind that is that over, since I really started YouTube, I have been moving. I have had to move every year and I'm just now, um, uh, I've just now become established to the point where, uh, you, you're going to start seeing some some room tours uh next year because i'm i'm able to I, I am starting to build it up to the point where i i'm happy with it i say yes this is this is what i'm proud of instead of this is just functional so i just hang tight i know everybody loves that and and i love them too so uh but yes you will be seeing that from me uh sometime in the near future probably before i get a seahorse we'll say that Speaking of Jacksons, how are your three pregnant females? I don't know how they are. They don't communicate with me. They just look at me and say, <laughs> and so I don't know what they, uh, what they're up to. Uh, they're, they're looking okay. They're looking good. So the thing is, uh, they had, they looked like they were pregnant before and then they, they must've absorbed whatever they had and they never gave birth and so now they're looking pregnant again so i don't know if i'm about to get a bunch of babies or if they're just going to absorb it again these uh these are ones that i have held back for well number one females are hard to sell uh but i've also held them back because i like them they were nice and i and they looked like there's something so the thing is i don't know I really don't know what's up with these three and I don't know what to expect. And, you know, them holding back like that, either they're going to absorb it or maybe there's something wrong internally and there's a problem. <sighs> so, you know, all I got to do, I just have to take care of them the best I can and be ready with fruit flies. That's all I can do and sit back and wait and see what's going on. So yeah, they're leading me for through quite a quite a um quite a fun chase there. Um see Genevieve has uh, a 3.1 Honelli. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey Rebby from the Netherlands. Excellent, excellent. It's very good to have you. We have a Panther chameleon. Uh, good choice. Had her th for three weeks now, and recently she started closing her eyes during the day. She still has appetite. Do you know about this? Rabbi, that is your first sign that something is off. And take this very seriously because uh, when they start becoming lethargic and they start closing their eyes, that is a warning sign that something, not that something has started, but that something is further along than you would like and so you are it's not overreacting to take this very seriously and the reason is is because if you wait until you are sure what the problem is then it's usually too late to do something about it so the best time to nip this in the bud is now where you have a subtle sign and so uh the the big challenge now is to figure out what is the problem what is it in husbandry that you can change? Uh, the, yeah, there's definitely possible that there's something internally wrong that's from birth or something, but 99% time, literally 99% of the time, it is something in husbandry. The temperature, uh, UVB, parasites, I, you know, I'm just throwing out things because it could be anything. The thing is, it now's the time to go through each and every aspect of your husbandry to see if you can pull out what it is. And this is something we all have to do whenever our chameleon gives a sign that something's off and, you know, we just don't know. Uh, 
So you know, you can go to the chameleonacademy.com care sheet for the Panther Chameleons. I have a pretty extensive one on the website. And just take a look at each and every aspect and figure out what you are doing differently. That doesn't mean if you have this list of three things you're doing differently from my care guide, it doesn't mean that those three or any one of those is a problem. What this does is it gives you something to look at first. It's a, it's a first clue for you to look at. So, I mean, whenever we put together care guides and care sheets, we have to make a, we have to select something. And what we're trying to do is figure out what the ideal conditions are. And, and, you know, it, it's a, as a big of an approximation as we can make it because 365 days of the year, none of them are the same. And I probably none of them match the day that I have on the care guides. So our attempt with the care guides is say, okay, if you attempt to have this group of parameters and you do it 365 days a year, it's going to be give you success. And so just because something doesn't match up doesn't mean it is a problem. It just it just gives you something to start off with. Oh, hey, Misty Mountain Fans is here. Hello. Oh, we bet that's my wife she's the gecko girl and she's here it i always get excited when she joins my live sessions Let's see Spo spooge purchased a hybrid enclosure from you recently and my four-month-old abanja is absolutely loving it first time cam owner and your videos have truly helped me to provide proper entry excellent i'm very glad I'm excited to hear that uh, things are going well for you and your little Umbanja. That is great news. And thank you for coming on to let me know. All right. We can get you sea dragons as well, Bill. Howard, how are you going to get me a sea dragon? Okay. For those who don't know, Leaf Sea Dragon is, uh, what is it, like $10,000 <laughs> or $20,000 now? Is ten if, if you can get a hold of them, how are you doing that? Uh, Nat V, I'm recently new viewer. I'm glad you mentioned your wife. There's still hope for. <laughs> well, you know what, Nat and Misty Mountain fans who just joined is is my wife. And if you want to see what she does, if anybody hasn't doesn't know Yvette, uh, I, I I often have her come on camera. But you can go see what she does on Instagram. You just look up Misty Mountain fans, and there's underscores between the under the uh, between those words, and you're going to see all sorts of incredible. Uh, Satanic Leafdale Geckos, your plate is fantasticus. That's what she does. And so you can go check that out uh, and see what she's uh, up for, what she does. Let's see, Emerald uh, Jenny says, I wanted to share my happiness about finding silkworms at her show today. Congratulations. Fortunately, I won't be able to get hornworms in Germany anymore. Oh, no. The only seller is not breeding anymore. Oh, silkworms are so nice. They got one of my, I have a, one of my shamrock chameleons, the Ashonasi eye, uh, he just won't eat. And he looks like he's got a, a swollen gular. And I'm worried about what's going on when I open his mouth and I look in his mouth. I don't see any swelling. And so there's just something that is not going good with him. But silkworms got him to eat. So that's going to be a touch and go thing. Nanu Fuku. Hello, Bill. How are you? I am doing great. I'm hanging out with my chameleon folk. Is there an age cutoff for breeding your female chameleon? Mm, uh, I, there's no official age cutoff. And often they will continue to have eggs for their entire life. So even if you stop breeding them, they may produce eggs anyways. And so, yeah, I'd say there's no real cutoff. Uh, a number of people do stop after two or three years, three, four years, depending, uh, and then give the female the, the rest of her life to just hang out and, and relax. Uh, so it's a very subjective thing. I don't think there's, I don't know of any agreed upon cutoff by the community. Jimmy Stockton says, well, I finally got one of these. What's up from the East Coast? Welcome, welcome, Jimmy. Glad uh, we got a representation from the East Coast. Uh, thank you uh, for joining. Kick back, have fun, drink a coffee or a beer, and uh, uh, let's talk chameleons. Hey, Stephanie's here. Hello, and Christopher. Oh, my goodness. 
Just got my delivery of black coroplast. Time to make some hybrid cages. Excellent. Spooge, how often should I be cleaning out my misting system and how would I go about cleaning it? Well, it depends on what the situation is. You're uh, really, the actual misting in the tubing generally doesn't, doesn't isn't a problem because it's black. There's no light that gets in. And so it stays pretty clean. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, basin is your that you keep your water the water reservoir that's what you got to watch out for uh, never use a clear container for your basin because algae will grow but if you have a black basin uh, you know if you keep that covered and sealed um you know it, it needs the air to come in but uh, uh you won't have to clean it often uh, I, me, I'm going about twice a year and, uh, and that, you know, that works. So, but you know, when I used clear, like you, I used the water jugs at one point, these things, I mean, I would just get algae in there and you know, that that's not good. So it really depends on your system. Um, <laughs> Genevieve. Genevieve, you're supposed to be on my side. You're, you're a chameleon bird. You're supposed to be on my side. Crack that whip. Make sure he's taking good care of your babies. I I try. I try. Um, stinky. Hi, Bill. Have you ever talked, written about how to establish a connection with an importer? Not that I plan to, but, well, it depends on, uh, Stinky, what you want to do. If you want to purchase from an importer, it's really easy because that's what they're in business to do. And so you're a customer. So you just have to get to know, uh, figure out who they are and then say, hey, I'd like to buy this particular chameleon. And they, that's what they're there for. Now, if you're talking about an exporter, like within a certain country, that's where it starts to get a little bit uh, dicey because people who are already importing generally don't want to share that information if they've got a good relationship because they don't want the competition which is fair um, and the people contacting you from that country are not necessarily the most reputable and so yeah finding an exporter from a certain country is challenging and there's no real easy way to do that it's one of those things on personal connections and just need to <clears throat> make those personal connections it takes it takes a lot of work and there's no easy formula uh, and if you want to uh if you want to if you want to talk to an importer and get a relationship with an importer like if you're in the united states uh you just jay dubay of uh, uh one world exotica and, uh, and he's on facebook and instagram uh, so it's pretty easy to find him and uh, say hello He's in business to uh, sell to people like you. So chat, we need 20,000 so we can get a breeding pair. <laughs> Wait a minute. Um, <laughs> yeah, if we were talking about the leafy sea dragon. Yeah, I'm not sure those are even legal to get. I haven't checked into it, but uh, you know, when I was looking into it, what, 10, 12 years ago, those are going to be difficult. Yeah, maybe I'll <laughs> maybe I'll start off with a uh, captive, captive born dwarf seahorse or or erectus or whatever something like that and then they'll get into the leafy sea dragons uh let's see uh rabbi bakir thank you for answering our question we'll check out the care sheets and the vet mentioned she seemed healthy so a bit confusing uh yeah see and robbie this is the thing with chameleons uh, you as the keeper have an advantage that you see the chameleon when they are relaxed. And that's when you're going to get the first signs that something's wrong. When you take the chameleon to the vet, they are hyped up on adrenaline. And the natural thing they do is want to show that they're strong. And so it's a good sign that your vet could find nothing wrong. That means that your chameleon, whatever's going on is in the initial stages and your chameleon has the strength to pretend nothing's wrong. But this is where it's critical for the chameleon keeper to pay attention because you're the one who gets to see the chameleon when they think no one's looking. And that's when you get the true uh, sign of what's going on. I can guarantee you, 
absolute 100% that if you don't change anything, that your chameleons will keep their eyes closed longer and longer and longer until you bring them to the vet and they're so far gone that they can't pretend that nothing's wrong. And that's when it's obvious what's wrong. Oh, okay, it's an infection. We need to give you antibiotics. Oh, okay, they're egg bound. We need to do surgery. Uh, and and th this is the challenge we all run into that the best time to address something is before it's obvious what exactly it is you are addressing. And I, I, I wish it were another way, but that's just the way it is. And I mean, it makes sense. It's the same with every living creature. It's the same with us. Uh, when we are we are strong and we can pretend like we don't have the flu, we don't have a cold, we go into work. Hey, yeah, hey, how's it going, Bob? And such. And, uh, you know, and then we go home and go, oh, gosh, we feel like cold. We feel like trash. Uh, that's at the time where if we start taking care of ourselves, we have a hope of getting over it. But if we wait until we absolutely cannot crawl out of bed and it's obvious that we're sick, now yeah, we, we can't do anything about it. The difference is that a chameleon, not only can they not talk and cannot tell us what's going on, they don't want to. Everything inside of them says, pretend that you're strong or else you're picked off. So yeah, good good uh, luck with that. You're good to take this. You're, you're absolutely right to take this seriously early. And I'm not pretending it's not hard to figure out what it is. You're, it's, it's time to play detective. Um, and, and uh, make sure what, what's really helpful for the vet is take pictures of them and then bring those pictures into the vet. So the vet can see what is actually going on when the chameleon is not hyped up on adrenaline. That's, that's the way you can work with your vet. Um, and I mean, my vet, first thing he asks is says, what are you seeing? Because he's got a, he's got a chameleon that looks healthy in his hands. And so first thing he does is says, Bill, what are you seeing? Because he's dealt with reptiles. He's dealt with chameleons for decades. He knows, he knows what they do. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, Misty, Yvette, and Genevieve are all talking about my my performance in the uh, gecko room. <laughs> Sensors. I'm talking about taking care of geckos. Yeah, that's right. it would be nice to have your products in Europe. Hard to find an equivalent. And Sophie, Colin, I agree. The shipping across the Atlantic is just ridiculous. It's like I I'm even. As some people have asked me to quote sending things over to Europe, and I'm just embarrassed to give that quote. I mean, the, the shipping is more expensive than the product. <laughs> just looked on the Googles. Looks like they're not legal to keep as pets. Probably talking about the leafy sea dragons. <laughs> they have them at the aquarium here in Tampa. Yeah, they had some at uh, Aquarium over the, the Pacific in Long Beach near me. At least they used to. I would just sit there and watch them. They are so incredible. Oh my goodness. Everybody, we're talking about leafy sea dragons. It's, a, it's like a seahorse uh, because I keep saying that I'm going to get a seahorse. And uh, yeah, uh, Yvette, I told everybody that I uh, I let you know that I'm uh, I'm thinking about getting a seahorse because, because I think about it for years and then, then decide to do it. And you say, wait a minute, where did this come from? So um, I'm giving you notice. And so I told everybody how I have to do that. Okay. Lay Townley. Hello, Bill. I have 63 eggs in my incubator. Oh, you're in for a adventure. I had no idea they were going to grow. I didn't even think they made it. <laughs> you thought that they were infertile. <laughs> what would your best advice be for me as a first time breeder? Okay, Lay. Let oh that's two clutches by the way oh good 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 uh so first of all I'm let's see if those are two clutches I'm going to guess that those are panther chameleons uh let, let me know if I'm correct uh, veiled chameleons generally if you said six to three eggs in one clutch I'd say veiled chameleon so I'm gonna guess it's a panther chameleon uh, are these both by the same 
same female is this a retained clutch or uh let's see but okay advice for people who have eggs that they did not expect that they were going to get so first of all whenever you have eggs put them into the incubator and if you don't know if they're fertile or infertile put them in the incubator incubate them and if they're infertile they will mold over if they um okay lay says yes and yay so we're talking about two clutches from the same female that is uh that tracks and so keep them in the incubator if they're not uh if they're not uh if they're not fertile they will eventually mold over if they are fertile then they will start to develop they will start to grow uh slowly grow and this is now your time to get ready for however many eggs you have that's how many babies you may get and unfortunately you don't know for sure how many will hatch and you're thinking oh man am i really gonna put together 63 cages and then chance number one how where in the world am i gonna put 63 cages and then how am i going to um <laughs> what happens if they just i put together 63 cages and then they turn out to be infertile and so that's a lot of work and yeah hi that's that's just the way things go now uh when you have 63 uh keeping chameleons individually raising the chameleons is the best way to do it period um that said and so i make it a i want to make it very clear that chameleons should be raised individually i also acknowledge the reality of the situation that the chances that you are going to put together 63 cages is pretty is is slim if you can do it wonderful but you're probably not going to be able to do it that would be a huge project a huge expense and if you don't if you're not a real breeder you're not going to want to put in that infrastructure i mean me i'm a real breeder and by real breeder i mean <laughs> i i mean to breed i i intend to breed and i will breed in the future and so when i buy these cages i expect them to last for 10 years um so you're going to probably have to put together uh and do the bin raising method uh and i am going to and people i am going to talk about the bin raising method i i as a chameleon academy i gotta i i i walk a a tightrope between i gotta say what the best husbandry is but i also realize we are real people we're in a real situation and we need help that's realistic so uh allow me to talk about the bins with full acknowledgement that on the podcast and such i will talk about individual raising because that's the best but uh, so the way the you want to want to do is get as many bins as possible and uh, by bins i mean these plastic sweater boxes and i put uh plants at the bottom got to make sure that they don't go uh that uh, that they're not able to climb up and get out and put a network of small branches in there uh, and over a number of these bins you can have a uvb light regular light and uh spritz them down with the misters and uh have little fruit cups that have uh that that attract fruit flies and that's a way you can set up a baby system um i'm not going to be able to give a full husbandry now i can already see myself going down that rat hole and uh, spending the next five hours talking about taking care of babies um i do have some uh some resources on the chameleonacademy.com that talks about putting together babies uh a baby setup and i i don't know that you have as much time to wait until next next spring by next spring i'm our next yeah not spring or summer i'm going to be doing a specific mini series all about taking care of babies where i'm going to be talking about both individual raising as well as the bin raising and so uh so i i will have more information on that coming but uh take a look uh what you may want to do is take a look on chameleonacademy.com 
where I talk about surprise babies, where I talk about setting up babies for Jackson's chameleons, because when people come and ask about how to take care of panther chameleons, they're generally more serious about breeding. So I talk about structure. When people say, hey, my female Jackson's chameleon just had babies and I wasn't expecting babies, then I just talk about, let's just try to survive this. And so I think, Lay, you're probably in the, let's just survive this situation because you weren't expecting them and you didn't want to be a breeder. Um, so you have the uh, decision to either try to set it up or find somebody somewhere that lives around you that would like to uh, incubate eggs and raise up babies and just give them the eggs. Or maybe you hold back five, five eggs, 10 eggs, whatever, so you can have fun raising and then give those eggs to someone else for them to uh, them to raise them up. That's that's actually what I do. I my greatest joy in raising chameleons is raising chameleons, hatching them out, and spoiling them rotten. I can spoil them rotten if I get five to six babies. If I get thirty babies, well, now I'm stuck in a a mass situation. And so I actually like the idea of holding back six eggs and then giving the rest of the eggs to someone else to do whatever they're going to do. And uh, I like doing that. And, and of course, when you do that, I can do that because I have a network of people that I trust, that I know can, are serious about this, will take care of the, the eggs and such. And, and that, so I don't, I don't send it off. I don't advertise. I don't say, hey, everybody, anybody want this hatchling? I, I have my network of advanced people who I know know what they're doing. And so I'll just send it to them. I, I So there's a rumor out there that I sell eggs. I don't sell eggs. I've never sold eggs. I I, I don't do that. So that, that's ridiculous. Um, but I, I will give eggs to people. So I don't have 30 babies, so I can have six babies. And when I have six babies, oh, they get their own cage. Not only a little cage like this. No, no, no. They get their 16 by 16 by 30 planted. And each one of them has this little paradise. And that is so much fun. Let's see if I, I'm probably so far out of uh, off the chat. Oh, well, Lay, thank you very much for the, the, uh, the sticker. Appreciate that. Uh, I took videos of what I was seeing from my Panther and it was acting off super Eliza. Ann. yep, that's the, the vets just love it when you bring in evidence of what you've saw, because when they're looking at the chameleon, sometimes it's hard to figure it out. Let's see. Genevieve says when, when I go out of town, poor husband is stuck with my menagerie, which he was patient with, but doesn't, un doesn't understand my passion. He whines on how much time it takes. Yeah, it does take time, but. I, I am grateful that I have that situation with Yvette. This is very, very, very special. Very, I, I just love it. Just love it. His goal is that nothing dies while I'm going. Yeah, that's my goal too. <laughs> oh, let's see. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to uh, catch up in the chat. So just hang tight, hang tight. Hello, Kenny. Oh, and I love Eliza Ann and Spooge. I am so glad that everybody is finding community uh, on forums or anywhere else, and you're all supporting each other. That is what makes this community uh, very cool. Bill, is the mesh in the Reptibris medium cages too big that fruit flies escape them? Um, the I don't believe the Hydei get out, but... Uh, the smaller ones, like the the natural ones, natural flip flies, will definitely get in, and I and I rely on that. Mm -hmm. I have a baby, and I'll put um, um, oh oh, I just got a a question. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, Facebook people who are here on Facebook, my software just went off, and so I'm actually having to read the comments off of the YouTube feed. And my my chat has just totally broken uh, with this software, and so I am not getting any of the Facebook messages. I am so sorry. I didn't I, I didn't think about saying that. And so no, I'm not ignoring all of you. 
Uh, I, I value your input just as much, but my software just made a huge as as having real problems right now, so I'm not getting the uh, the uh, comments from Facebook. I'm very sorry. I should have said something. I just I just didn't think about it. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I I've just spent a whole hour ignoring people. I am so sorry about that. Um, uh, Jim, thank you, thank you very much for uh, reminding me of that. So. Uh, Let's see. Oh, now I feel bad. I love all my Facebook people too. So uh, let's see. Helena says, Bill, I hope you were well. Saw your story on Facebook. You had Kaluma brevicorn eggs. You have a ground and not in vermiculite. Can you explain why you have them underground? Okay. So uh, I have a number of uh, brevicorn eggs and I, I sh showed a picture of them in a, uh, in a container, but I, I put them under dirt. Uh, clumped together under dirt. And I did that because uh, as an experiment to see how they uh, hatch out. Usually chameleon eggs are uh, are sitting on vermiculite. That's how we normally do it. Uh, we spread them out over vermiculite. But I wanted to try it, uh, them clumped together underground mm -hmm. as they were laid. And uh, now this isn't totally natural because I put them there, not the female. So We'll see how that goes. But uh, yeah, it was uh, just an idea to see how they're going to do uh, when they are put together, uh, put in a, in a nat more natural setup. And uh, I have one on top of the uh, on top of the surface. And so we'll see if when the babies all hatch underground, if they all hatch together because all the eggs were communicating. So it's an experiment. Uh, Ooh, Nicholas, you finally made it. You're late. Guys, oh my goodness, it is now 109. I know we got a late start because I had software problems, but thank you all for hanging in there with me. I will, the next time I go live, it'll be uh, Tuesday. Uh, once again, Facebook listeners, I, I, am, I am glad at least the video and the audio got to Facebook. Really, I, I'm going to have to change my software. Uh, if it's going to continue to give me this kind of problem. But uh, any last questions, uh, at least on the YouTube people, because Facebook, I can't see you. Let me see if I can, maybe I can pull up to Facebook. Okay, Facebook people, I'm going to go back and take a look at that chat and I'm going to answer you all in, um, in uh, let's see, uh, let's see when I, uh, I'm going to go and answer you, uh, independently. <laughs> so, uh, Ooh, take a nap bill. Yeah, I do need a nap <laughs> and self clear. Yes. Yes. I get need to take care of it. Uh, today is a watering day. I think no, yesterday was watering day. Today is feeding day. Oh, today's going to be a late night. So, uh, Spooch, thanks for doing these live sessions. I know I, I love doing these and I'm really grateful for those of you who, who show up because uh, it's a lot of fun. This is, it's so much fun. So much of what I do in the content creation, I am doing alone in a room, but these live sessions allow me to, uh, come out and, uh, and, and interact with you all and see you all and you can see me. Oh, by the way. Yeah, you, I, I'm doing this new thing. If you like these live sessions, if any of you are on TikTok, I go live on TikTok 5 p.m. Pacific on Sundays. It's not a formal show or anything. I just do my fruit fly cultures. So 5 p.m. on Sunday is my fruit fly culture building, and I do it live on my TikTok channel because I don't do a whole lot on TikTok, but I know I need to do more there. So at the very least, I have an informal live session where I am making fruit fly cultures and you are welcome, encouraged to join me if you're on the TikTok platform and if you would just want to hang out with me and uh, make fruit flies. So, and, and I'm, and I show everybody the, the progress I have made. And my first one that I did uh, four Sundays ago is about to bloom. And so we can all celebrate with fruit flies. So. Anyway, that's the next time I'll be live. Uh, so I'll, I'll sign off here. I want to thank you all very much.
for joining me and I'll see you later. <laughs>